Hello, this is Andrew Womack, and again, we are getting ready for our Tuesday Night Live Bible study. That'll be starting at 6 p.m. Mountain Time, and uh, it's just a great time. I really look forward to this. I just got back from a week's worth of meetings in Atlanta, uh, Georgia, with Creflo Dollar, and then I was at Eagle Mountain International Church on Sunday with George and Terry Pearson. So that's Kenneth Copeland's uh, ministry there and man I had a great time and I just got in last night I wasn't able to uh, be on the Truth and Liberty broadcast but I watched it live and tonight you can watch our live Tuesday night Bible study and you can participate you can send in questions and we spend around 20 minutes or so just answering questions after I've taught some from the Word and so we have some questions that came in through the last Bible study that I wasn't able to get to. And I'd like to take just maybe 10, 15 minutes here and answer some of these questions that came in. So Jeannie on Facebook said, what scriptures do you stand on most frequently to feed your faith and spirit and help you stay on course? And Jeannie, you know, I don't have uh, a group of scriptures that I confess or anything like that. I'm not against that. There's a lot of people that have these daily confessions. Matter of fact, some of the people that are partners with me, some of the people that I've uh, discipled, for instance, uh, Carly Teradez has a whole list of confessions that she says, and there's certainly nothing wrong with that, but I just don't do it. I don't have a formula, but I just fellowship with the Lord, like this morning. I have been up and I went through a bunch of emails, but then I studied the Word and I looked at some things, and it's just whatever God quickens to me. And when I read Scripture, He brings other Scriptures to mind. And um, anyway, I don't have a set formula that I go through, but I do have thousands of Scriptures that I have in my heart that God has spoken to me. And as I'm dealing with something, like if I'm dealing with discouragement, all of the Scriptures that the Lord has shown me on discouragement, I have... The Holy Spirit will bring those things back to remembrance and I will just sit there and meditate on whatever it is that's ministering to me. If I need uh, healing, I will sit there and start recalling all of the scriptures that the Lord has shown me on healing and on and on it goes, if it's finances or whatever. So again, I know that this may not be the answer that you're looking for and especially when you're first starting out, uh, it's helpful to have a list of scriptures. You know, one of the things that I would recommend is that Greg Moore who is a man who runs our Karis Bible College in Colorado, in Woodland Park, Colorado. Uh, he's not over all of our schools worldwide, but he's over the local one right here. He's got a book that he put out that was scriptures that he stood on for healing, for family, for finances, for encouragement, against depression, etc. And he's got a book that uh, he put out that is just those scriptures organized into these different subjects. You could take something like that, and that would be a starting place. But I really believe that as you mature in the Lord, you just need to be seeking the Lord. And then whatever it is that God's laying on your heart, whichever direction he's leading you that day or that week, those are the things that you focus on. I think that we can become so strict in our relationship with the Lord that God wants to lead us in a new direction or show us something new, and we just are so focused on these things that we limit what God can do. Again, when you're starting out, I think it's really helpful to have those scriptures, but as you mature in the Lord, you just need to be in relationship with the Lord and be more sensitive and let God lead you. Scott on chat said, what is the best method to get Satan out of your finances and eliminate all debt? You know, I think what this is talking about, Satan uh, is coming to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And finances are one of the things that every single person watching this right now, you have to have finances. We've, we've had, sometimes had people tell us that, you know, we shouldn't even be focused on that. Well, it shouldn't be your God, and you shouldn't work just to get money and things like that. You ought to be doing something where you can be a blessing to people and you can use your gifts and talents. But it is a reality that we have to have finances, and I guarantee you Satan affects us in this area. You know, I remember talking to um, Oral Roberts just a few months before he died. And I remember that one of the questions that was asked, I was in a group of about 15 or 20 preachers that went to his home. And one of the questions that they asked is, what is the hardest thing you've ever had to deal with? 
And, you know, he went through people trying to kill him. He had people fire at him at point-blank range and miss him. He has been disgraced. He was uh, expelled from Australia uh, as practicing uh, medicine without a license. He has been ridiculed. And, you know, there's just a lot of things that go with ministry. And so he could have mentioned a myriad of different things. But, I mean, boom, just like that, he says, Finances, that's the hardest thing I've ever dealt with in my life. And I can relate that even though I've had people kidnap me and threaten to kill me and spit in my face and I've got blogs written about me, the the worst thing I've ever dealt with is finances. And uh, so let me just say that Satan, uh, he comes at you and tries to hinder God's supply towards you. And the number one way that he can do it is through you not operating in God's system. Now, I could teach on this for a long period of time. I'm going to give some real quick answers here. But if you are out in the world system doing things the world does, the way the world does, and you are hocked up to your ears and you owe everybody, the scripture says the borrower is servant to the lender, that it's a curse to owe people money. And I don't believe that God is mad at you. I don't believe that you've sinned if you're in debt. But I guarantee you, you give Satan an inroad into your life. Uh, He comes to hinder. And plus, you will pay for things two and three times what they're worth. And so I believe that there needs to be a uh, total forsaking of the world's system of finances. And we need to go to the Word of God and follow His instructions. And there's many things in the Bible. It says if you give to the poor... You're lending to the Lord, and that which you have given, he will repay. It says, give, and it'll be given back unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, Luke 6, 38. It says in Mark chapter 10 that there's not a single person that's ever left house, father, mother, brother, sister, lands for the sake of the Lord, but what you will receive 100-fold in this life. And there's just so many things. Giving is an important part of prosperity. Withdrawing from the world system and not paying for things on credit, doing things debt-free as much as you possibly can is an important part of it. You need to get to where you don't trust in riches. And this is where so many people make a mistake. They really do trust in the money that they have in the bank. And when it comes to giving, they think, but if I gave, what would I do? You'd have to trust God. That really is what it comes down to. There's so much. I've got a book on this entitled Financial Stewardship that would really help you. Again, our helpline is open right now. You could call, and we've got people standing by that could give, like, for instance, if you have a question about these scriptures, you could call our helpline, and they could direct you towards Carly Teredes and her confession seat and Greg Sheet, excuse me, and Greg Moore's book, where he's organized scriptures on certain topics. They could also send you to my book or my teaching on financial stewardship. The number there is 719-635-1111. And anything I'm talking about here, if you call that number, 719-635-1111, they will be able to uh, answer your questions and direct you towards any of the materials that we have to be able to help you. Pastor Mary on chat said, what should... What would you say to the family that was praying for a child injured in an accident who doesn't get healed and moved to heaven? Well, first of all, that is a tragic situation. And, you know, sometimes you don't need to explain everything. Sometimes you just need to go to people that are suffering and and just say that, you know, I love you, I'm praying for you, and I believe that God's going to comfort you. Sometimes when you go and say, I know what you're going through, their immediate response is, you don't know what I'm going through. You hadn't lost a child. And so I think sometimes we are too quick to try and get everything fit into our little boxes so that we can understand everything. So I I would first of all just approach a person and start ministering the love and the mercy and the compassion of God towards them. But if they are curious, which is often the case, and if they are saying, why did God let this happen? I would make sure and tell them that God did not kill their child. There is a misunderstanding, and a lot of people believe that God controls everything that happens to you. And as much as it's as it does, you know, in the short term, it actually blesses people for you to say, well, God had a purpose. God must have some wisdom. It takes away some of the sting 
and makes them feel like, well, I don't understand it, but I trust God and God had a purpose. In the short term, that may help you, but in the long term, I think it does a tremendous amount of damage because you're blaming God for killing this child. You know, if somehow or another I could be the one who caused this wreck and caused this child to die, and if I was guilty for that, I guarantee you these parents would never have a good relationship with me. Even if they said somehow, well, we believe you must have a purpose in it, I guarantee you they wouldn't want to get close to me lest I kill somebody else in their family. In the long term, it does damage to people's relationship with God to blame him for everything that happens. In the short term, it may give you a little bit of comfort, but it's just not the truth. The truth is what sets you free. You know, I had a situation where there was a family in my church when I pastored in Seagaville, Texas, and they had a little two-year-old boy who, or excuse me, it was a four-year-old boy, and this boy died. And they called me, and I went over, and I prayed for him for a couple of hours. I actually was holding him in my arms when he died. And we prayed for him for two hours to come back from the dead, and he never did. And anyway, I, they asked me to do a funeral for him, and I can guarantee you, it, I didn't want to say, well, I missed it. I didn't want to say, you missed it and blame them and somehow or another make their child's uh, death dependent upon them doing something. But I wasn't about to say, well, God had a purpose. God needed another angel in heaven. That's what a lot of people see will say. I told them the truth. And I said, look, God did not kill your child. This is not God. God is not a child killer. I said, either you missed it or I missed it. Both of us missed it or there's just something else that we don't know. But I said, I can guarantee you, God is not the one who's killing children. God does not control everything. And I was very tempted to say something that would make them feel better at the moment. But again, the truth is what sets people free. So I told people the truth. And anyway, it's a long story. I won't go into the whole thing. But the woman, because I told her the truth, she got to praying. And she says, so God, what did happen? And um, long story, the Lord explained to her and told her exactly what the problem was. This woman had this child when she was in Guatemala. She was a very small woman, and it was a big baby, and so she delivered the baby in the taxi on the way to the hospital, and because of that, there was some brain damage. It was what, you know, people get offended today when I say this, but this is what she called it. It's what it was diagnosed as. The child was mentally retarded. Today, I guess they call it something else, mentally challenged or something. But anyway, the child wasn't normal, and it had no immune system. And the doctors told this parent that if this child ever catches a cold, that we can't treat it, we can't do anything. A, a simple infection like a cold will ch kill this child. And so anyway, that's what happened. And this child died when he was four years old. And um, anyway, the Lord showed her that she had accepted this diagnosis, that she had lived in fear. And even though they were trying to believe God that there was just total fear, on her part and the Lord showed her exactly how it was that Satan was able to cause all of this and cause this problem. And because she was so small, the doctor said, if you ever have another child, you can't have it natural. You'll have to have it by C-section. And they said, we recommend you never have a child. This is, you, you just aren't built to have children. Anyway, because this woman, I told her the truth and she got hold of the truth she couldn't go back to the doctors because they wouldn't encourage her to have any children. So she just had all the rest of her children. I think five more children, natural childbirth at home without a doctor. And when they all graduated from high school, she sent me a picture of each one of them and said, thank you for telling me the truth. She wouldn't have had those children if she would have said, well, God must not want me to have children. God's the one that killed my child. I'm telling you, you just have to tell people the truth. Again, I don't know that I'd go in with my guns drawn, ready to just jump on them and say that God didn't do this. I'd go in and, and minister the comfort and the mercy of God first. But if those questions do arise and if it's appropriate, well, then I would certainly minister that it's not God that killed them. You know, God doesn't control everything. If they died in an accident, it could have been the other driver. It could have been a mechanical failure. It could have been uh, wet roads or slick roads or all kinds of things. There's just natural things that happen. The devil does not control every single person that dies.
There are tragedies that happen. BNC Woods on chat said, Can we have expectations for my handicapped daughter to be healed? I know she loves God, but doesn't have the concept of salvation. Again, there's probably a lot more information here than what is in this uh, question. But it sounds like that the child isn't mentally able to comprehend and things like that. And so when you aren't able to minister to the person that needs healing, to me, that makes it a lot harder. I don't have a gift of healing where I go and just, you know, release the power of God towards someone. What I do, I'm a teacher and I have learned things about faith and I teach people how to believe God and how to receive. And if the person I'm praying for isn't able to respond to me, well, then that puts it into a whole nother realm. I believe that you need somebody with a gift of miracles or the gifts of healings to be able to operate in that situation. Now, I'm not saying that you couldn't do it, but if this person is not mentally capable, responsible for themselves, well, then I believe that the parents, to a very large degree, have control and authority in that person's life because God isn't holding them responsible. We do have uh, on our videos, again, if you were to call that number, 719-635-1111, we have videos and we have one family that their child had Down syndrome and they prayed and the child has been completely healed of Down syndrome. We've had a number of things where people got healed where they weren't capable of receiving the healing themselves, but somebody else reached out and believed for them. And so you could call and have access to those DVDs. But yes, you should have uh, expectations and hope. Uh, to the degree that you can, I would minister to the person that needs the miracle. But if they aren't physically or mentally capable or responsible for themselves, then I believe that the parents have a lot to play with that. Angela on chat says, how do I really change my expectations to good? You know, expectations of good is what the Bible calls hope. So in other words, how do I have hope would be another way of phrasing this instead of just always anticipating everything to go bad. And in Romans chapter 15 verse 4, it says that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. You know, Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So it's very clear that Faith comes through the Word of God. The more you meditate on the Word of God, the more your faith is going to rise and function. I believe all hope is, is faith over a prolonged period of time. Faith for the future. So hope is just another manifestation or an enduring type of faith. And I believe that it comes through the Scripture. So how do you change your expectations to good? You need to be studying the Word with all you've got. And you can live vicariously as you see God move in other people's lives that their situation was more hopeless than yours. And yet you see God comes through for them. It builds hope on the inside of you. And you, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, have hope. JB1 on chat said, I am new to believing. I'm blessed. I struggled with knowing I'm blessed in the free will of others where what they choose to do isn't such a blessing. What is the best way to realign my belief? Well, I've got an entire series on blessings and miracles. That's an old teaching. My newest teaching, my, one of my new books, is How to Receive God's Best. That's the same teaching, kind of updated, and it's all about operating in God's best. And that will, that will really establish the blessing of God in your life. But JB, when it comes to other people, you can't control other people. And if you have expectations that being blessed means nobody's ever going to rub you the wrong way, that everybody will treat you right, that's unrealistic. You cannot control other people. What you do is you get to where you're so blessed that it doesn't matter what other people do to you. God's going to work it together for good. You're going to come out smelling like a rose regardless of what the devil throws at you. So I don't know exactly how you're believing, but if you're thinking that somehow or another blessing means that you'll have a perfect marriage that nobody will ever disagree with you. You'll always be blessed at your work. That's not the blessing of God. But regardless of what other people do, you can still flow in the blessing of God as long as you know that God is for you. So anyway, we're out of time today. But we are going to have a Bible study tonight at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. And I would encourage you to join us. And again, you can 
uh, participate. You can send in your questions and I'll either answer them during the Bible study tonight or maybe next Tuesday we'll have another session like this. But I'd encourage you to check it out 6 p.m. Mountain Time for our Tuesday night live Bible study.